we got a lot of Phillies rumors. If you go to 97.3 ESPN.com, you can kind of hash them all out. Frank Close covers the Phils. He joins us now on the Boardwalk Honda Hotline with uh, what is a very interesting offseason, Frank, for the Phillies. And their name is attached. I mean, a laundry list of guys uh, are attached to this franchise. So uh, let's start with how active do you anticipate the Phillies being? I think they might be one of the most active teams in all of Major League Baseball. You know, if you look around the league, there's not that many that have that financial ability that the Phillies have. So, you know, the Phillies have their, their key targets. You know, you expect them to be looking into the Manny Machados and the Bryce Harpers. Uh, and on the pitching side, you know, they're looking at Patrick Corbin. But they also need to be ready for plan B. And so I think they're in on basically everybody because if you don't get one of the big names, then you got to go to the next guy. And there's still plenty of next guys, even behind the really, really big names. So this is shaping up to be a pretty fascinating offseason. Uh, of the stories, of the names, which one are you uh, – which one do you think is the most realistic? That's a really tough one. You know, I, I think, though, that, that Manny Machado, there's not – the same amount of landing spots for him as you might see for Bryce Harper. You know, it seems like, you know, if you look, pick through some of the rumors that are out there and, and some of them honestly conflict with one another, you know, you had, you had Steve Phillips say, well, you know, they're not going to be on, uh, you know, the Yankees aren't in on Harper. I mean, on uh, Machado, but they are on Harper. And then you have uh, someone a couple days later, uh, Joel Sherman of the New York Post say, well, they, they don't really project, project to be in for either. Uh, you know, the Red Sox are kind of out. They have no real reason for, for an infielder like Machado. Um, well, he might be able to use them, but, you know, they, they really don't have the need because they're going to get their shortstop back. And, you know, when you when you look around and the Dodgers are really close to the luxury tax, they just re-signed Clayton Kershaw, so they don't have any money freed up. There's just not a lot of possible landing spots for, for Manny Machado, and I think it might come down to something where you – to see a team like the Phillies and potentially a team like the Chicago White, White Sox who's lurking with money to spend and at the bottom of a rebuild that might be able to take on a Machado. Uh, but of all the options, the Phillies seem like they're the most attractive option for somebody like Machado. Yeah, I mean, uh, Machado is an interesting case because, you know, there's a lot of people out there kind of saying, ah, he got a dogs a little bit. I mean, he got a, a couple of uh, controversial moments in this World Series. My question is, if you brought in a Machado, who's better than anybody you have, would you have to play him at shortstop? You've already got Crawford. You've already got Kingery. So does Machado, as a shortstop, entice you? You know, I think he is better suited at third base. Uh, you know, the, When he did go back to shortstop, the, the metrics generally did treat him pretty well. Uh, you kind of figure even if he signs with the Phillies as a shortstop, he probably ends up at third base someday anyway. Uh, a lot will depend on what they do with their surplus of inventory. Uh, you, know, uh, you know, Megan Montemuro of The Athletic was just writing about, uh, hey, where does J.P. Crawford fit in on all this? And, and really you have to ask the same question about Scott Kingery. What's Scott Kingery going to do? Uh, Cesar Hernandez has moved, and that might open up second base for Scott Kingery. And, and your middle might be a Machado and Kingery, at least at first. You know, a lot really depends on on, on other moves. I, I think the Phillies don't necessarily have to entice Machado with shortstop uh, like, like we once thought that he, they might have to do because there's not necessarily a lot of people uh, looking for shortstops or third basemen at that price tag. Yeah. So, you know, I, I think the Phillies – the Phillies might throw that carrot at the end of the stick uh, unless they really feel like they're in a negotiating position where they don't have to promise that. You know, they might be able to just say, look, we have a lot going on. We plan to bring in a lot of really good players this off season, And you know what? We'll see where you fit best. Uh, now, Machado, when he went to the Dodgers, he seemed more than willing to, to do whatever was asked of him because, you know, as soon as Machado got traded to the Dodgers, then Justin Turner got hurt. So then he was able to play some, some third base for them and, and they used uh, Chris Taylor at shortstop. So he seemed open-minded. Maybe he'll be that same open-minded. And you know what? That, that kind of money he's going to get, it seems like you're willing to do whatever they'll, they'll, they'll tell you to do at that price. Machado, 26 years old. His uh, war last year, 5.7. And then there's Bryce Harper, who is 26 years old as well. His war, just 1.3. So uh, why would you sell me on Harper over Machado if you feel that way? 
You know, I'm not sure that I, I, I prefer one over the other. I, I say the Phillies are in a position where they just they need to get whatever young talent they possibly can and then let it all work itself out afterwards. Uh, you know, when I look at Bryce Harper, I see somebody with incredible talent. Uh, perhaps he wasn't utilizing u- utilizing it the best last year. Defense. Uh, but offense, you know, a player like him, you know he's just going to perform long term. And, and remember, he's still only 26. <laughs> so, it, it, you know, we're not used to seeing that that major of a free agent available at age 26. Yeah. Usually you don't see these guys hit a free agency like this until they're closer to 30. So, let, me, uh, let me chime you know, in real quick on Harper, Frank. The fact that he's left-handed, and I know that sounds like, well, what's the difference? But these shifts seem to hurt the lefties way more than they obviously bother the righties. So does that play into it when you look at, hey, if I'm going to bring a guy and spend that kind of money, i got to get a guy who I think is going to be able to produce much more because of his the side that he hits on, essentially. I mean, Machado's right-handed. He gets much more opportunities for hits than a left-handed Harper does. Is that is that fair to say? Well, you know, there are more, there are more right-handed pitchers out there than left-handed. That's absolutely true. So if you're playing the, the left-right split, you're more likely to face a righty than you are a lefty. But in terms of the defense, I, I don't know that it matters that much that I would be worried about it. You know, he's going to hit a lot of balls in the air, too. <laughs> you know, certainly – uh, this is a guy who drove in 100 runs and hit 34 home runs last year. Now, his batting average was a little bit down. And, yeah, his war certainly was down, uh, which which that alone is not that impressive. But, you know, I really a lot of times it's, it's a matter of finding the best talent and, and, and just getting it and then worrying about the rest later. I think if you build the right lineup and you have somebody like him who is your left-handed bat, you know, kind of going in tandem with, with Reese Hoskins, you know they they you know they really wanted Carlos Santana to kind of fill that left-handed role last year. Um, he might not be the ideal left-handed guy. Uh, you know, of course, Santana's a switch hitter, so he's able to hit from both sides. Uh, but you know, I I think that you do need an impact lefty bat to go with your impact righty bat that um, really build the lineup in a way that that functions. And and I'm not that worried about the the war just just this past year you know a lot his overall war if you look at the number and break it down the offensive war was 4.2 what he got dinged for was his defense and the defense was because they were throwing him in center field so if you put Bryce Harper in right field yeah even if you know if you look back to 2017 where he did not really play center field he only played right field yeah he had a defensive war of zero so in other words he was level and his offensive war was 4.3 so basically, he gave you the same exact offensive out- output as the year before, except his defense didn't bring him down. So if you're following that baseball reference war, uh, it's a little bit deceiving because playing him in center field just kind of dinged him, and, and you know that that really wasn't fair to him. I don't think if you, I mean if you're really worried about the defensive war, uh, the Phillies will not put him in center field. I think that's pretty certain. Uh, you mentioned Corbin, um, lefty uh, pitcher, which uh, I don't think this team has had a lefty pitcher since Hamill's left, right? I mean, Morgan had a couple of starts, but a regular guy in the rotation. Uh, Corbin wore 4.6, 29 years old, had some injury issues. Uh, let's uh, let's um, talk about him a little bit and his fit. Yeah, I mean, really, he is the, the best starter on the market this year, uh, certainly being left-handed, that is something that the Phillies badly need. I mean, it really takes you back to Adam Morgan being a regular member of the rotation in 2016 since they had somebody from the left side. And you know what? I, I can't stress enough, you know, when the Phillies faced the Boston Red Sox and they over those four games this season, when the Phillies had three left-handed relievers and Tommy Hunter, who was very good against lefties, and they stacked them all up, that's when they beat the Boston Red Sox. That's how they beat the Boston Red Sox. You know, they really need somebody that can go in and attack a lineup that has a lot of left-handed hitters. And, and yes, the, the, the injury is possibly um, something that might make you, uh, you know, uh, take a little bit of pause. You know, I mean, he's had, he's had Tommy John surgery, and it does make you a little bit nervous. Uh, but, you know, for some people, they get their – their one Tommy John surgery out of the way, and yeah. they, and they uh, you know, they're fine after that. But, right. you know, looking at Corbin last year, you know, having someone to give you 200 innings anymore is, is rare. And 300 strikeouts, uh, you know, like, I, you know, I'm looking at, I'm looking at Corbin's that last year. 
you know, how much better would they have been? You know, and, and I, I think what they've realized too is just in general that when you're playing three young players all at once, like they did Velasquez, like they did with with Eflin and Pavetta, you know, when you have three of them there, you're you're going to be susceptible to to one of them not not really work. I, by the way, I misspoke. I meant 246 strikeouts uh, in 200 innings. I had that round number in my head, uh, but. You know, you need somebody like that who's who's steady, who's reliable, uh, who's going to give you give you well again some innings from the left left side. It just makes so much sense to bring in somebody like him. Uh, but the danger of of signing a starting pitcher, of course, is is injury. You know, you you put out all that money, yeah. if you have somebody who's hurt. Um, you know that that that's really hard to recover from. So so we'll see. I mean, but the honest the honest thing is, the only other left-handed really. Uh, starters out there are the likes of Jay Hawk, who's who's getting kind of up there in years. Keuchel, uh, you know, he's. I'm sorry, Dallas Keuchel. Uh, Keuchel. Yeah, so so if you look at the starting pitcher market, uh, you know the the lefties are are basically Corbin and 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 Happ, and if you thought that Cole Hamels was going to be the one who was who was going to be uh, out there, you know, it used to be a foregone conclusion. He bought it, he bought out. And Dallas Keuchel, you know, talking about him from the left side. The problem with him is he's also coming with some, with some concerns of of injuries and durability. Uh, not that he's had, not that he's had many. Uh, he had he had a little bit in 2016 and 2017. Uh, but you look at the mileage on that arm, you got to wonder too how much can can you get going forward because he's he's not necessarily a a spring chicken either because he didn't uh, come into the game much later. Now I'm looking at at Keuchel's. Projections for 2019 on Baseball Reference. They project him to be at 11 and nine with a 3.71 ERA. Uh, for some reason, they project him to have one save. I don't know what that's about. Uh, but uh, um, <laughs> that but, final you know, Sunday look- of the uh, regular season, they need him to come in and <laughs> hammer the door closed. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Uh, but you know, you can't you can't ignore that he, he is 30 years old. And then the question becomes, what do you give somebody who's 30 years old? You know, you're, you're a little bit. You're a bit a little, you're a little bit more comfortable the younger they are now. Corbin's only 29, uh, which isn't a whole lot less, but uh, you know it, it's tough. It seems like Corbin Corbin showed last year he was perhaps a little bit a uh, little bit stronger, a little bit more consistent than Keuchel, and uh, that 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 might make you give a, a, a little bit of pause. I mean, Keuchel was not bad. I mean, he was 12 and 11 and 11 with the 3.74 ERA, uh, but you you look at where that's trending, you know it's trending upward in that he had, you know, 2016 was a little bit tough. Certainly he had a, had a great all-star season in, in 2017, but only pitched 23 starts. Had a full season this year, but it seemed to, to drop off just a little bit. Uh, you know, he did allow a lot of hits. Uh, you know, he led the league in hits in 2018. Hits allowed. Frank Close, 97.3 ESPN.com. He's got uh, a plethora of Phillies information right now on our website, including the buzz about Bryce Harper, Manny Machado. Uh, Aaron Nola has been named a finalist for the Cy Young Award. He's one of the uh, three finalists for the NL Cy Young Award. I think um, uh, DeGrom ends up getting that, but it's nice to see Nola's in the picture. Uh, his story on uh, Patrick Corbin. So uh, I know that the the uh, free agent list has got those two big names at the top and a couple of guys, you know, Corbin's right there too. I guess he would be the third guy. Are there any other names on this year's c- class that you think make sense and would be a good fit? You know, I think a lot of it depends on, on how the rest of the, the, the offseason goes. I mean, the, the Phillies certainly can – Explore a lot of different trades. You know, I think a lot of the young talent the Phillies have. We, you know, they're, they're they're very very good players, but there's no superstar. Um, does it take trading the likes of like a Nick Williams to, to get you something that you want in terms of pitching? I mean, that that could that could depend on that. Um, then you have to ask the question: Do the Phillies want to get in on uh, free agent catchers to pair with with uh, Jorge Alfaro? Does that mean you bring Wilson Ramos back? I mean, he's 31 years old, has some in- injury histories. Most of the other catchers out there are are usually up there in years. I mean, Brian McCann's of the world. You know, uh, if you can get them on a shorter term term deal, you might want to match somebody like that with with Jorge Alfaro. Uh, but in terms of of other big names, I think you get the complimentary piece after you get your big piece. So if if let's say Manny Machado is the one you're able to pu- able able to pull off, and you can't get Bryce Harper for the outfield. Well, then maybe you look at the outfield free agent class, and if the price is right, maybe you try an A.J. Pollock, who's a nice player, center fielder. Again, he's had some injury issues, which might uh, bring his price down a little bit. You could say the same thing for, for Michael Brantley, both of them. They're 31 and 32 years old, respectively. 
Uh, or do you do you try to maybe get somebody even a little bit older than that and, and have a veteran bat in the corner outfield uh, from the left side, like an Andrew McCutcheon or a Nick Markakis? You know, are those the types that you're gonna you're gonna try to to um, try to pick up because you missed out on the uh, you missed out on the lefty bat and Bryce Harper and, and I don't know. Uh, you, in other words, uh, there, there's complementary types out there. If you don't get what you really want, you can kind of see what's out there as as sort of a, a nice veteran middle of the road piece and and even though he's not a lefty i think i think uh somebody uh like andrew mccutcheon might might help a young phillies team as well even though he, again he's not the left-handed bat you're looking for uh we're talking with uh, frank close uh at frank close on twitter and of course you can check it out at 97.3 espn.com um so if you don't end up with machado uh and or um harper does this have the feel of like the Sixers all season, where if you don't get one of those guys, it's a massive disappointment? Yeah, I definitely think there will be some disappointment, but you know, I think at that point though, they they realize they need to have an impact talent, and maybe that means you try to make a trade. Uh, and you know, ideally, it's it's it seems like you want to do the better thing, which is sign somebody that only costs you money. Uh, you know, you, you know, you sign Machado, you don't even have to give up a draft pick, you know, because he was traded during the off season. So, so. I think that's that's ideal, but if you, you might have to make a trade for an impact type player and be be creative, uh, and I think if if that's the case that they miss out on on, on everybody, uh, that it's got to come from the trade market because you know look, looking at the free agent class, this was the big class. You know, a lot of them fell off the face of the earth that we were expecting to be to be real studs back in the day because maybe some of them have, have have gotten injured over the years and you know. Andrew McCutcheon of today is not the Andrew McCutcheon of, of yesteryear. And, you know, you used to think that Garrett Richards, you know, the Angels would have been a tremendous name. He's been hurt. So um, so, so you, you might want to try to take some chances on a couple players with some injury histories and, and try to make some trades. But, they, you know, they need impact talent. Uh, the, the, the one team that's supposedly considering a teardown is somebody like the Seattle Mariners. So you might look at their roster if you're the Phillies and see what what you can get as part of their teardown and uh, you know since you have pieces to trade, but mm-hmm. um, they seem to be the only one that might be willing to to tear things down. And we don't even know if that's the case yet. They might be looking to add. You know, I said that if if, if the Mariners are looking to contend next year, I think Carlos Santana. Well, which is which for doesn't them. sound well. The Mariners. The report today is they're considering a full teardown. Yeah, that's, that's so. So if I'm the Phillies, I try to capitalize. I can get if I can get some of their good pieces. You know, they they have Mike Leak as somebody. Mike Leak is a starting pitcher that that's pretty good. That's on their roster. Uh, you know, you don't want you want to stay away from Robinson Cano. Uh, but um, you know, D Gordon is a name the Phillies had an interest in in the past. If, if he can be had, I think the Phillies would be all over that because he has that that type of impact talent. Uh, so, uh, but but you know what the the Mariners that they're known for making trades galore and. It seems to me like uh, you know they should not just concede at this point. I think they've got a couple more moves in them, but but if if they really do decide to tear down from the Phillies, I'm in on Marco Gonzalez. I'm in on Mike Leake. I'm I'm, I'm in on D Gordon. See so see if some of that talent can come come to the Phillies. And uh, Marco Gonzalez, you know that that could be your left-handed starter potentially uh, for your rotation. He doesn't have the numbers of the other guys, but he could be. Could be helpful to the Phillies. Do they have any guys at the Triple A, Double A level that you can envision uh, challenging at spring training? That's a really, really good question. It seems like at this point the Phillies' talent has really risen to the top. Um, it seems like there's going to be a little bit of a of, of a uh, a little bit of a lull uh, for their prospects. The only one that that seems to be kind of moving up up the ranks quickly is Adam Hastley, their former first round pick. Who is a left-handed outfielder bat? Um, I, I don't think he's necessarily going to make the club out of spring training, but but he's he's lurking. Um, you know, I, I think those prospects all rose together, and and you know what? I think one thing the Phillies could do this off season, if they do pick up some pieces in free agency, is to try to convert some of the young players uh, to more talent for the system, so they have more rise to the top. And let's face it, you know, the Phillies let their let their uh, your player development director walk away and Joe Jordan this year and they weren't than, than was, uh, you know, shown on the field in terms of numbers this year. And they're looking for a new coaching staff to try to get that out of it. So, uh, but 
in my mind, Hastley is probably the most major league ready of those those types of prospects. But otherwise, I think we're going to be waiting a year or two before we start to see more of those guys rise to the top. All right, a couple quick hits with you here. Uh, opening day, Carlos Santana will be playing either what position or not here? I think he will not be there. And, and I, I say that as somebody who's not a Carlos Santana hater. Uh, I do think he brings value, and I think I think the Phillies got what they, they thought they were going to get out of him. A um, couple bad months, all right? That, that There's no denying that, that he was he was below average for, for two of those six months. Uh, but I think I think there's going to be interest in Carlos Santana. I think they realize they need to move Reese Hoskins back to first base, and the way to make that happen is to, 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 uh, to trade Carlos Santana. Uh, you know, especially if you sign Manny Machado, you do not want your left, hit, left side of the infield to be Carlos Santana at third <laughs> and Manny Machado at, at shortstop. That would not work. So I, I, think, I think you try to move him through the Phillies. It might, you might have to eat $5 million a year to do that, but uh, I see the Seattle Mariners as a great fit if they do a teardown. And the Cleveland Indians, who are looking to sell off some some assets, uh, you know, uh, Phillies might want to talk to them because uh, supposedly they need a little bit more offense. They might trade one of their starting pitchers, maybe even Corey Kluber. Uh, so if the Phillies can uh, maybe bring down Santana's contract, they take on Kluber. Obviously not the one-for-one one is going to make the deal. It'll be the Phillies' prospects that make the deal. Uh, but he might land right back at Cleveland and um, move Alonzo to the designated hitter so that they have that, that offense they're looking for. Uh, the other guy, I mean, some possible trade candidates, I guess, would be Cesar Hernandez, Odubel Herrera, uh, Michael Franco, J.P. Crawford. Uh, of that group, I mean, uh, how do you feel about that group of guys uh, potentially not being here? Now, there's one thing I've heard repeatedly, and I think I'm going to actually write this up into an article one of these days. One thing that I keep hearing is you don't want to sell low. Well, I say that's nonsense. I think you want to win. I don't think you want to entrust positions to players that have not shown to be consistent players. So uh, I would move Adubo Herrera if I can get a more reliable option in the outfield. I have no problem seeing the Phillies do that, even if they are, quote-unquote, selling low. Uh, Cesar Hernandez did not have the same year that he had a couple years ago. Uh, and you know what? If you get Manny Machado, if you need the space in the infield, uh, I'd rather see Scott Kingery play every day at second base than Cesar Hernandez, even if you're, quote-unquote, selling low. So so I, I think the biggest mistake that the club could make is, is to try to hold on to guys in case they bounce back. Because I think we're at the point, watching the Phillies, that you need them not to just simply hope that they'll bounce back. You need some, you need some money in the bank at some of these positions. And you can maybe afford to have one or two of them bounce back, quote-unquote, uh, but you need to clear the space. And you need to bring in steady, reliable players and if, if Odubo Herrera is not doing that for you, if he's not a reliable piece, then, then I think you need to trade him, even if you don't get what you're gonna, you would have got for him a, a year or two ago. And honestly, I think there are some people out there, some other teams that would love to take on Herrera as sort of a wild card that could exceed the value that's sent in a trade. And, and you know, if you're the Phillies, maybe you take some Class A talent that, that has high upside. And you hope you you know you try to accumulate those guys and see who works out long term. Yeah. But uh, I think you can't be afraid to sell low uh, because you need you need major league players that are going to give you consistency. And if you're not getting it out of those guys, then you need to make sure you move on. Uh, real quick, about thirty seconds prediction: Do they land one of the big names, Corbin, Harper, Machado? I think they get Machado. And if they get hard, if they get Bryce Harper, it's because Scott Boris waited too long and they sign him late, maybe close to spring training, like they did Jake Arrieta. Yeah, interesting. All right, uh, more on the winter meetings when stuff happens with the Phillies. Frank will be here. Ninety-seven three ESPN dot com has all your Phillies off-season coverage, and of course, Frank Close, like all guests, appeared via the Boardwalk on the Hotline. Thanks, pal. Thanks, Mike.